the next panel is modernizing app delivery, apps without red light. And that's going to be led by Nita Shetty. So Nita leads security and enterprise networking business development for Cisco Investments, where she acts as a partner and a champion for our portfolio companies, helping them accelerate their businesses. Over the past decade, Nita has held various business acceleration roles here at Cisco, spending the majority of her career in Asia Pacific. When I asked her about her hobbies, uh, she said that she's really gotten into running recently. So I told her that we'll have to run a half marathon together. Um, but she's also gotten really into binge watching uh, Money Heist and Tiger King. She said she's a little late to the game there. So now I'm going to hand it over to Nita. Thanks, Ashley. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining today's panel. My name is Nita Shetty, and I lead security portfolio development for Cisco Investments. And today, I have two great panelists to talk about modernizing application delivery. As we all know, application delivery has become extremely complex in the face of multi-cloud environment, especially in the last few years. Now, this brings a host of challenges. Organizations are looking for network agility and increased capacity without compromising on application performance, reliability, or even security. So to talk about this, we have two great leaders in the security and enterprise networking space. So let me introduce you to Jeff Reed. Jeff is the Senior Vice President of Product of Cisco Security Business Group. He's been on this particular role for over three years, but prior to that, he's also been a Senior Vice President for Cisco's Enterprise Networking and Solutions Group, where he oversaw a business of $16 billion of networking product portfolio. He has a bachelor's of science degree in industrial engineering and an MBA, both from Stanford University. He lives in Burlingham, California with his wife and two teenage kids and enjoys basketball and traveling with his family, which he hopes to do sometime soon again. Welcome, Jeff, to the panel. Thanks, Nita. Yeah, you forgot Trixie the dog, but otherwise that was very comprehensive. <laughs> oh. Next, I have the CEO of NS1, Chris Beavers. Chris and his co-founder founded NS1 back in 2013. He's got, he's got his PhD in robotics from Rensselaer's Polytechnical Institute, where he now mentors a student. He lives in New York area with his wife and an extremely energetic toddler, which I can say is absolutely adorable as I get to see his pictures on Twitter. He once lived on a boat in Singapore and considered building a pizza business out there. Chris, welcome yeah, to the panel. Great. Thank you, Nita. Appreciate you having me. So, Chris, from a pizza business to founding NS1, can you tell us a little bit more about it? Sure, yeah. So, NS1, uh, we're a, a DNS and DDI uh, company. So, DNS, the domain name system, is this foundational protocol, the internet that, that turns domain names like Cisco.com into the IP addresses that your browser, your apps actually connect with behind the scenes. And then DDI is an extension beyond DNS into the protocols that give our devices like our phones IP addresses to connect to the network and, um, and help them discover applications. We play in that space, so think of this as foundational networking technology. We're about a seven-year-old business, and today there's two major lines of business. Uh, at NS1. One is what we call managed DNS. We operate a big, huge global delivery network. Our software runs on that network, and many of the key domains and applications on the internet are powered by that network. Meaning, when you type in something like LinkedIn.com or Dropbox.com to your browser, our job is turn that domain name into the right IP address for you to connect with to interact with LinkedIn's or Dropbox's application. Um, the other line of business for us, DDI, we ship the same technology that, that powers our cloud managed DNS services with some additional capabilities uh, for our customers to run inside their networks and power those networks. So you can think of these as uh, foundational technologies for modern cloud native elastic networks, uh, powering most of the biggest uh, enterprises and key applications in the world. And what our customers are doing with our technology first uh, is focusing on unlocking leverage in these um, these foundational protocols or, or networking technologies toward user experience, performance, availability of applications. A good example there is 
Uh, we recently steered all of the live streaming traffic for the Super Bowl. And there, our job was make sure nobody ever sees a buffering icon when they're opening up the stream by sending users to the right content delivery infrastructure to, to, to meet that requirement. Um, another big reason our customers tend to work with us is um, minimizing costs to deliver, improving efficiency. Um, and here, this can mean everything from automating uh, the DNS is part of the CI/CD uh, process um, for developers, all the way through to preferring, say, in that Super Bowl example, the cheapest CDN that's going to make sure a user never sees a buffering icon. And another key reason our customers are working with us is because these are such foundational protocols and technologies for every application and every network, it's uh, paramount that they be secure. If you want to take over an application, um, taking over its domain uh, is one of the highest leverage ways to do that. So our customers trust us to secure these protocols, to keep them online in the face of big attacks that are happening all the time, all over the world. So hopefully that gives everybody a good sense of, of what NS1 really is. And I think it's interesting, Chris, just, you know, as we've gotten to know you, like the, the idea of like how you built like basically cloud native technology and are now extending it into DDI and allowing customers to use it. I mean, it's kind of, it's, it's like kind of a perfect, you know, mix of bringing that capability and then allowing it to really scale and function and automate. And, and that's because that's a new, like that, you think about this space, it's not a, DDI hasn't been a sexy space for yeah. a while. You guys are you guys are bringing, but you're showing like how critical it can be to a well-performing environment. Well, it's and it's also a new dynamic simply because of you know, the the convergence of um, everything that powers our enterprises and our networks and behind the firewall, right? And what's happening on the internet, uh, the cloud side, right? These technology areas are all aligning in ways they haven't before, and so these markets historically they've been totally separate markets, right? Yeah. You have the DDI market which is relegated to appliance vendors, boxes, yeah. right? Yeah. And then you have the managed DNS market, which is networking companies who all run the same software. And you know what's changed is everything on the internet now is complex and spans all of these things, hybrid cloud, basically, right? Um, and it makes sense now for these markets to align and be powered by tech that is aligned, right? And exactly. converge. So let's get into the panel. Uh, my first question is for Chris. Chris, as users, we've got accustomed to near instant responses from websites and web applications. Um, this creates a whole lot of challenges to, to the IT team. Uh, can you talk about some of those challenges? Yeah, you know, it's actually, I'm, I'm glad you um, raised the, the pizza point um, because a lot of NS1's business is inspired by my time in Singapore. When I first got to Singapore, which was in the mid-late 2000s, right, um, just a tiny chunk of the internet was fast, right? It was really tippy top of the internet companies who had invested in global footprint and presence and recognized how important that, that is. By the time I left, a lot more of the internet was fast, and that was because everything changed through the 2000s, right? Everybody realized that users outside of the east and west coast of the United States matter, right? Uh, if they're trying to grow global businesses, which is the promise, right, of uh, the internet, um, well, you got to meet those, those audiences where they are, and users rightly everywhere in the world expect great experiences, right? Um, and, you know, there's this, this little problem of physics that gets in the way of that. You can't really beat the speed of light. Um, so if you have a user in Singapore and they want to access a piece of content that sits in a data center in Ashburn, Virginia, well, that's a problem, right? Because there's no way around the 200 milliseconds in each direction um, uh, for that traffic to, to, to flow. So what we saw happening in that time frame was everybody with global audiences investing in user experience and putting content and data and code closer to audiences. And all this was enabled by all the other changes that were happening through the through the mid and late 2000s, right? The emergence of public cloud and DevOps methodologies and content delivery networks, right? So we just saw all of this change in the way applications were being built and delivered in response to this demand and this expectation of audiences. And you know, now, now you, you can't really put an application on the internet if you don't meet these sort of table stakes requirements for providing great user experiences to, to audiences all over the world. Absolutely. 
And Chris, you spoke about some of the challenges from the network and the infrastructure perspective. But obviously, there are challenges from the security standpoint. Jeff, what are your views on that? Yeah, so kind of similarly, if you think about where we've been, the journey over the past like 10 to 15 years in terms of both where the applications built and delivered from, you know, the move to the cloud, et cetera, as well as where the users are. So you know, we've seen this kind of explosion of mobility and distributed workforce, et cetera. And so, you know, kind of as that's happened, you know, the basically the structure of your network's changing, as Chris is very familiar with. And, you know, part of that is how are we thinking security aspects? And, and what we're seeing is essentially where you place those security controls and even in some cases, what type of controls you need are changing as we you know, move to the cloud and, and kind of you know, see this kind of scale out from the user side. So, so that's what we're seeing. And, and so I think one thing that's starting to happen is, you know, do we start investing more and more in terms of like, where's kind of that service edge for delivery of things like security capabilities? And I know we're gonna talk about DNS here in a little bit, and that's been a big one. So that's, that's really, you, know, you can think about over time, how do I want to continue to kind of rethink that? And there's both the, how do I protect my users that are going outbound to applications? And then also as the application deliverer, like what are the types of security aspects I need to have, you know, on the inbound side? And and, and so those are all kind of changing in this mix right now. And, and frankly, I think we're we're still we're pretty early on the security side. I explain, I think, you know, Chris is part of his, what he's done. Like, I feel like in a lot of ways, the Delivery side is in, is a little more mature. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, I think on the security side, it's, it's a little bit less so, and and you're going to see this opportunity for new capabilities and services to really come up on the particularly on the security. But actually, on both, but we're seeing I think a lot of ways we need to catch up on the security side. That's a great point that you're making, Jeff. So obviously, we're talking about these challenges. But to overcome some of these challenges, businesses need to change the way they are thinking about application, networking, or even security strategies. So can you talk about where are these businesses making investments today and have those priorities shifted as part of COVID? <laughs> the short answer, James, yes. Um, you know, what we, I mean, it's kind of amazing actually how successful like, most of our customers have been given in many cases was you know days or at most a couple of weeks to figure out how do I how do I basically prosecute my business with no one in my offices and branches anymore. Mm -hmm. And you know, so we saw this just massive uptick initially around yeah, you know, how do we enable remote access? And then what are the security controls that I might need to think more about, invest more into as part of this process. Even and, and how do I make sure that like my network can handle this? Like there's so this like that. Let's just say March and April were very busy months. I think mm -hmm. for me and Chris. I can imagine. Um, yeah, on that and and you know, we've seen this interesting thing where you, what we saw is clearly things like you know kind of VPN capabilities very high priority. Saw a ton of spend there, but I think you also saw customers who had. Started down the journey for journey for certain services, really pivot more there, and, and the, probably the two that I highlight would be one on the we've done on the again kind of coming back the cloud security, you know, things that you could deliver as a service in a matter of you know hours or days became really really valuable in that move, and and so we saw a big uptick in things like our umbrella service, and then also kind of looking at how do you protect the this is really about how do I protect my users that are going to applications and also, you know, they're not within my network as much and yet we're mm -hmm. going to be, you know, we to be enabling that. So what we saw is really things on identity and kind of access. So for example, Duo, you saw a 30% increase, I think in, you know, a couple of weeks in terms mm -hmm. of all. And we saw this set of customers that had said, Hey, I care about this initially. You know, when I, everyone was in the office, I cared about it for, you know, a small percentage of my, population now i need to roll this out across all my users and so that was a big thing that we saw as well uh just recently great chris um what are your yeah. thoughts there just just to just to add some data points to what jeff's 
said, right? So, uh, you know, let me relate a, an anecdote. So m- mid late March, so maybe a couple weeks into this whole big shift, um, one of the things I was doing was talking to our customers as one does, right? And I was talking with a major, major software company, hundreds of thousands of employees and talking with one of the business unit leaders there. And she relayed to me that she was on the coronavirus task force in this business. And um, she, she talked a little bit about, about uh, what they were focusing on. And it was really instructive and interesting to me, right? This is a gigantic software business, um, big SaaS company, right? And um, uh, every morning they were meeting and they were looking at KPIs. And the first KPI, of course, is how many of our employees are infected or impacted by this somehow and what are we going to do about it, right? And the second KPI right after that for this gigantic software and SaaS company was network performance and saturation, right? And why was that so important to them, right? Why was that top of mind for the CEO? And, um, I think the the simple answer there is twofold, right? One is productivity of the team. Can we work, right? Because um, we're used to we're used to having infinite bandwidth with respect to each other, sitting across the table and being able to engage very directly. And now it's all like this, right? It's all over video conferences or video chats and, and other other medium. And securing that is a whole new beast. Um, um, making that a, an effective experience is a whole new beast. And it's all done over the network, right? So that's that's one side of it. And the other side for this company, they're an application company, right? And their applications are now suddenly being accessed in totally different ways, different workloads, different patterns, because everybody who uses their technology is in the same boat, right? Um, and you know, one of my biggest takeaways from that conversation, and it's played out in meeting after meeting after meeting since then, is uh, everything. Every everything has changed in terms of how we're accessing um, uh, our applications or engaging with each other, um, kind of overnight. And it's 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 really shown a spotlight right on. The network, right? Um, like foundational network services are, are they're no longer, you know, strategic forward thinking investments that, you know, are aligned with some transformation strategy over 10 years. They're business continuity level investments. And you know, just just backing up a little to the macro trends that we've seen accelerate, right? What we're seeing, what we've always seen, you know, I'm holding my phone up and uh, is an explosion of devices on these networks. There's an explosion of um, different ways that we're accessing applications. The applications are moving around. There's dynamicism in our footprints, both inside the enterprise network and and yep. in the applications. And um, there's more distribution, as we've already talked about, um, in terms of the workloads and how we're accessing. And and that all buckets to more complexity, more heterogeneity. And this event just just you know put the pedal to the floor on that trend right and that's what we're doing. Exactly. exactly that as as jeff said right like what we've what we've seen here is um a pivot is a good word right or like a massive acceleration of things that were already happening they just, there was just no impetus behind them right and now there's an immediate impetus which is we can't work until we until we drive this change fast right so chris um how would how would an organization know that they're successful at, at this? Like, how, how do they know if, um, what, what does a good application delivery look like? What are, yeah. what are some of the metrics that customer, customers are optimizing for? You know, of course, of course, the answer is it depends, right? Um, but, you know, let, let's, let's, let's look at this sort of broadly. If you have applications and they're delivered over the network or the internet, right? Um, Almost all of our customers, which are the applications everybody uses all day, every day, right, uh, are caring about a few things. Uh, one of them is user experience. And we've talk, talked about that a little bit already, but basic ways that networked applications are measuring this include you know, response time, right? Like you load a restaurant review on a reviews app. Like how long does it take before you see that? Or you go to a streaming media website. How long do you see the buffering icon before it starts playing? Um, or, you know, how often do we switch resolutions or, you know, rebuffer or things like that? So that's kind of user experience in a nutshell. Is it, is it smooth? Is it fast? Is it um, snappy is a good word. Um, and that is a big driver for anybody with an Internet application, but also now increasingly um, you know, behind the firewall or intranet or enterprise applications. All these user experience elements matter a lot, too. Another big driver is around 
what does it cost to deliver? How efficiently can I deliver this application to this <laughs> now very dynamic and um, distributed audience? And um, certainly that's just dollars and cents. Like if you're streaming some big, huge live event um, and you're using a bunch of different content delivery networks to do that, are you able to prefer the cheapest CDN to meet your, your performance requirements? That's an important, that's an important driver. Um, or am I able to send traffic to lower cost cloud infrastructure when, uh, when it's performing just as well? Um, but there's also, there's other notions of efficiency. There's, um, can I, can I, can I scale my application and its traffic and its users um, independently of scaling my team that has to operate this thing, mm -hmm. right? Or do I have to throw a lot of people at this problem, which is very inefficient? You, you know, can I can I automate? Um, so that's a big driver. And then the final, and this is maybe a good segue for Jeff, is security surrounds everything, right? Um, uh, and as we've talked about the the patterns of securing your traffic, securing your users, securing your applications have changed because of all this dynamicism and the more distributed applications and audiences and devices and everything else. And um, to meet those first two requirements while doing all that security, uh, securely requires automation at this point, right? It's too complex for humans to, to meet all of these sort of constraints all at the same time. Absolutely. Um, so what I'm hearing is one of the ways of modernizing is for modernizing for cloud delivery. Um, so in the past, I know both Cisco and NS1 have spoken about solving a cloud native problem with a cloud native solution. Sure. Uh, can you, Jeff, can you talk about your approach to that? Yeah, I'll start it. I know the, the, this is actually a really interesting topic. Uh, in, I think you've seen as part of this, this change at Cisco, really. Like you think about kind of like how we historically, you know, look, we were a network infrastructure company, we built boxes and look, we built the wonderful business and helped make the internet what it is today as part of that process. But you know, when Chris talked about, you know, the, how do you start solving things at scale? How do you deliver things at speed? It's really started to kind of change the equation here. And even, even like who the, buyers are you, you've seen like the application owners become like more and more i think you know force critical and and be you know they hold a lot of the budget often they're making the decision more and more and even you can think about things like DevSecOps. they're becoming part of actually you know the kind of the, those components. Yeah. so all that's kind of happened uh, or is frankly still happening as part of that and and so you know one thing that you'll notice for cisco is and actually chris is doing the same thing you know, how you look at delivery really becomes critical. And you know, we've done is really focus on as a service models um, as like a fundamental key of how to deliver quick time to value. It helps us build better products. You, you know, it's all the reasons why as a service makes sense. And, and we're essentially in this world where you're looking at you know, more and more of the functions that used to live on prem be able to be delivered via NASA service in, in cloud native way. And, and, and we actually learned, it's funny, if you look at our, the first time we moved the proxy to the cloud, we basically, we didn't architect it right. <laughs> so, you know, we, it was kind of the old school way. It didn't, you know, Chris talked about the ability to scale horizontally and, you know, how do you do those things? And frankly, we didn't do that. And you know, as a result, it was really difficult for us to keep that. You know, we had cost issues and scale problems and kind of all those things. And so, you know, we've luckily you know, we've had the ability to sort of do that again with what we're doing with our umbrella and secure internet gateway. And we started at it from a native you know, micro. How do I actually start native microservice from the beginning? You know, get as much state out of the application as possible. Scale horizontally, like. All those aspects have been really, really critical for for what we've done, and I think the last five acquisitions we've made have been native cloud, you know, technologies. So we just kind of seen this over time, and then I'll toss over to to Chris, but yeah, I think it's, it's interesting to look at like a foundational beginning of that was our acquisition of OpenDNS and and this kind of leverage we saw that we could get from DNS. 
Awesome. You know, uh, just to, to play off of that. So you just use two great words there, Jeff, right? Like foundational and DNS, right? And, um, <laughs> you know, also the, 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 the broad, um, uh, trend and you, you touched on this with the proxy story that I think is really interesting is that no, there's a lot of a lot of tech a lot of protocols a lot of um, uh, kinds of technologies that have been around forever um, but were designed or built or imagined first in an era that wasn't particularly you know cloud native um, exactly. I guess is the yeah. word. And, <laughs> um, and you know these protocols like DNS right DNS is a pervasive protocol of the internet and the network it is everywhere everything speaks yeah. it it's the first touch point for everything right and and yet um, it was designed in the 80s right when um, <laughs> you know there was what was cloud right cloud was a puffy you know, thing in the sky, um, and w w had nothing to do with with networking infrastructure. And it, this is actually what led led us to create NS One once we figured out the pizza wasn't wasn't the right option, right? And it was that we had learned, you know, in our particular slice of the world in my last business, building global content delivery networks, that this pervasive DNS lookup, this first touch point for our particular application had a lot of leverage and it wasn't being used, right? Um, and it's the same story as Umbrella or Open DNS, right? Um, uh, the, that DNS lookup, ton of leverage uh, as the first touch point toward the internet for security, right? Um, can this user, should this user be allowed to go to this domain? Is it a known bad malware domain? And it turns out if you just rethink that protocol a little bit um, around these these more cloud native environments or use cases, right? You can start to inject intelligence. And that's what that's what Umbrella is on the access side. And that's what NS1 is on the application side, right? It's all about, let's unlock some leverage in this protocol when people are going to whatever.com and ask ourselves, uh, based on all this data we have, what's happening on the internet right now, or what's happening in the infrastructure of whatever.com, um, and policy by the operators of whatever.com, can we can we can we optimize performance or efficiency or security for that application? So Umbrella and NS1 are sort of two sides of the same coin or the same realization, right? One on the access and security side and one on the application optimization side. Um, I think that's why we, we play so nicely together. I think, I think this is a great segue uh, to my next question. Uh, Jeff, we made an investment in NS1 last October uh, and the entire company was really excited about this investment. So can you talk about um, the work that has been done so far and yeah. what do you envision for the future? Sure, sure, yeah. So we're, we're super excited. Um, and, and Chris said it perfectly. Look, it's such a complimentary um, position for our technologies and products and what we do. Uh, yeah, we're really excited. And I'll break it down in a couple kind of key dimensions. So one is frankly, Cisco has a large, you know, route to market channel capability set. Uh, and this one has a market leading product that has already gotten, a, you know, it's like the kind of who's who of sophisticated application companies. But I think there's an opportunity for us to like work together. And we're doing that now of bringing in S1 you know, into our, our price list and, and helping, you know, scale what NS1 is doing. And it's, it's great for us because Let's just say there's some, there's some there's some other companies that are less complimentary to us and have some of this stuff not as good as S ones, but there and so we're working to bring that. So that's kind of that's like an easy step um, that we're moving forward. But what I think what really gets me excited is just seeing some of the what's the next step like from a technology perspective. And so I was you know Chris and team. We we have joint customers. One was a very large financial uh, institution. Had to get 160,000. I think is what the number was. You know, users. You know, this is a bank where basically you couldn't work from home, and then all of a sudden you had to work from home. And so this massive scale out of remote access in in the end of March, and you're know, using our VPN. And it turns out that in parallel, NS1 was helping them optimize like what VPN head in their users went to. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's this great complementary aspect of, you know, something where we, we had kind of a core infrastructure, but then NS1 was able to make that infrastructure work better. 
Um, another example is what we're doing. So Thousand Eyes is a recent, mm -hmm. we haven't closed the acquisition, but we're, we're you know, in process of doing that. And they've actually already had a really strong relationship between uh, the visibility that Thousand Eyes have and sharing that into NS1. So, I mean, the, I guess the way to peel out is there's some really interesting you know, areas to look at the performance and additional security functions that NS1 has and overlay with what we're doing on both a security and a networking perspective. Yeah, and I think our customers are going to be super excited about this, um, especially with the Thousand Eye uh, partnership. Uh, Chris, uh, how has your experience been uh, post the partnership? Like, what does yeah. it mean to NS1? So let me just, I'll just play off a couple of the themes that, that Jeff highlighted here, right? So obviously, we started um, together around Umbrella and NS1 because of just the the obviousness of it almost, yeah. right? Um, we're both playing in, in this DNS layer. We These are teams that know each other really well, technology areas that are really complementary and aligned. Um, and that's gone incredibly well, right? Um, I, I think uh, uh, one of the fastest, biggest partnership development processes I've ever seen. Um, uh, and as Jeff said, because of Cisco scale and NS1 tech and just the obvious alignment of these these two technologies, that's played out really well. We, we've since found um, a million other areas and rather than you know call all these things out, right? Whether it's Thousand Eyes, which is a really exciting, exciting move for, on Cisco's part from our point of view because of the existing relationship and our, um, our ethos around actioning on that kind of data um, uh, or whether it's SD-WAN or VPN or any of these other things. I think what drives it all, right, is that, um, again, these are foundational networking technologies, right? DNS, that we play in DDI as well, DNS, DHCP, IP address management. And we sit on both sides of the access networking and application networking sides of the fence, right? The system of accessing these key applications and the system of delivering these things. And I think we share the same hypothesis, right? Which is all of this stuff is converging in the cloud, basically, right? And so our business is about taking um, you know, these particular technology areas that we play in and driving that convergence as quickly as possible and driving value around that convergence with cloud native tech that is built with that in mind, right? And I think that's just directly aligned across all the business units at Cisco with um, the hypothesis behind what's happening in infrastructure and in the network and in enterprise, right? So, you know, broadly, I think that's that's what gets me really excited is it's not just that, you know, NS1 and Umbrella are integrated and selling together against some joint competitors. It's that the two businesses um, in their entire theses, right, are, are so well aligned and there's just so many different angles for us to explore. Absolutely, yeah. Chris. Just scratching the surface. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And Chris, I get to see the firsthand um, the benefits that our customers uh, get out of this partnership. So we're really excited about it. Uh, moving on, I wanted, you know, Chris, I want to come back to you. We've talked a lot about uh, trends today from automation to distributed application infrastructure. Let's let's take it forward uh, looking view into next three to five years. What do you mm -hmm. see as an emerging trend uh, that our customers should keep an eye on? You know, I, I, I'm gonna I'll give a couple answers to this question, right? So one, and we've touched on this a little bit already, is that I actually think this, this pandemic that we're in the middle of, um, uh, you know, is going to impact the way we build and deliver applications and build networks and access applications and the way we work, right, for for that time duration, right, three, five, ten years. Um, and we're right at the start of it right now. And so, you know, if there's one macro trend, it's that everything we're seeing right now is going to is going to keep playing out. Um, and, you know, I, I sometimes fall back to other shock events we've seen in the past, right? In my particular world, a good example is um, uh, there was a, a major managed DNS vendor back in 2016 that had a large chunk of the internet sitting on it that had a big DDoS attack against them and took them offline for about a day, right? And, um, and so there's two phases to the way uh, enterprises respond in that situation. Right? One is triage. And that's what we're still in the middle of triage with respect to coronavirus. Everyone's figuring out how do we work. Um, and as Jeff 
said earlier, right? Like it was surprisingly that's gone pretty well. Um, but, uh, it's, it's still, um, uh, a uh, little bit of bubble gum, um, holding yeah. it all together. Right? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly right, right. And so, you know, phase two is all right. Well, that that's important. We better not slip back away from that in case an event like this recurs. And we all expect that, right? With coronavirus, we expect yeah. to be in phases here. So now it's going to be all right. What did we learn from that, and how do we apply those lessons and make them stick, right? And I, I think, you know, we're gonna we're gonna see all of that. Um, the only other thing I think I'll highlight is a trend that isn't new, right? But that's just, you know, we're accelerating as a result of these conditions we're in. And that is toward, as we've just talked about, this convergence of access and application networking at the cloud. That's super, super important, right? When you think about it, just one quick thought on this, right? Across the street from me, very unfortunately, one of my favorite coffee shops has gone out of business, right? And um, it is a tough time in retail or campus or offices right now right um uh but all that stuff is going to come back eventually in six months or nine months we're all going to want to go buy coffee again right um so somebody's going to buy that thing or the original owner is going to come back and they're going to reinvest and then the question is how are they going to how are we going to lower the barriers to entry for them to do that and the tech stack for um anybody to spin up a business historically has involved a lot of gear and it needn't anymore right like all of the technology to to deliver these services securely, reliably, fast, cheaply from the cloud exists, right? So we can go faster now and we're gonna see that trend just continue. You know, we've been talking cloud for 10 or 15 years now. As Jeff said, we're still just at the start and it's just gonna go faster. Jeff, we'd love yeah. to hear your thoughts on this. I, mean, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the you know, Chris has used that word convergence and I, Sometimes I caution, like what the analysts are saying, don't read too much into this, but you know, this, you know, Gardner's, you know, they've uh, coined this term SASE, which is an awful acronym, but <laughs> it's, really, it's really this idea around, you know, you know, cloud native delivery of security and, and basically networking capability. And it's all about, you know, how do, how do folks securely access applications and how are we enabled to like deliver great experience in that same process and protect the application side as well? And, and I think it's, it's real. Um, there's, it's coming, you know, there's a bunch of work. It's still very, very early in that whole cycle, but I do see, you know, there's just no reason why. And, and Chris talked about, I mean, the thing about the cloud, it is the velocity the speed at which you can deliver, you know, it's enabling whole changes to business models as we've all talked about for years, et cetera, but, it, it, but it's real. And I think we, it's funny, like the network, but you know, networking and security are really now just kind of, I think, catching up to that. And we saw this kind of initial like SD-WAN motion and it's, but it's, it's, it's still happening, but there's more. And I think the types of things we can do, particularly with the type of intelligence that someone like NS1 has, like it, it makes like this huge difference of what you can get out of that infrastructure and how easily and quickly you can you can help your in the end users in that environment. So you know, just just to play off of that for a second, I think one more one more thought I'll throw in here, right? Um what we're learning right now, and we've learned every time there's some kind of big macro event, right? Is that businesses that are elastic are resilient right um and I, that that's the promise of cloud on the on the positive side right elasticity helps you helps you scale efficiently and build a big business fast and all those wonderful things but on the in a in a scenario like the one we find ourselves in right now um the businesses that have been able to be elastic in terms of how their users are working together or how um, their applications are reacting to different conditions um, are the ones that are are going to thrive. And this yeah. is why it, you see every enterprise today is either investing in cloud and the elasticity they get with it, uh, or they're not going to last, right? It's as, as simple as that. And so the drivers are existential now um, uh, um, toward building these elastic and resilient infrastructures, right? And, and infrastructure, I think, is an important 
piece of it. That's where Cisco sits. That's where NS1 sits, right? We are thinking about the foundational infrastructure now on top of which everything we do is built, um, is everything is over the network today, yeah. right? Um, and if that infrastructure isn't elastic, it's not resilient and neither is your business, right? So that that's the big, the big uh, trend. Yeah. Thank you so much for this. I think um, I'm sure our customers are going to keep an eye on these uh, trends. Uh, but this brings us to the end of our panel. So to wrap up, uh, can you both give our audience your one key takeaway and in one sentence? <laughs> That's an awful question, Nina. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think either of us know how to talk in one sentence. <laughs> well, I'll, 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 get, I'll give it a shot, right? It would be way too easy to say access and application networking are converging in the cloud, right? Because that, that's what we've just been talking about. But you know, there's one. Yeah, Chris, how, so you could say that. <laughs> <laughs> but how about this one? You know, we've touched on this just a little bit. I do think it's an important takeaway for everybody. There is a lot of leverage in foundational protocols of the network like DNS. Um, uh, and it's just waiting to be unlocked. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. All right, so my side, I think what, one thing is it, like, to me, like time to value and how you think about like the way you're structuring your investments, I think is is never been more important. And we, we've, to Chris's point, you saw like the, the companies that could react quickly are the ones that are gonna be durable. So just keep that in mind for all the decisions you're making as you continue to like respond to what's going on in the world. That's a great insight. Um, time to value. Well, thank you both of you for joining this panel today and sharing your insights. Um, I really, really appreciate it. And I personally got a lot out of this panel and I hope our audiences at home did as well. Uh, for the audiences who've tuned in today, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, really appreciate. And uh, if you would like to know more about us, learn about us, feel free to reach out to us or reach out to NS1 at ns1.com. Until then, stay safe and goodbye. Thank you, Nita. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Nita. <laughs>